which Christian group is the right one? Or church or denomination? Which is the right one? Well, I'm going to show you today from the Scriptures the answer to that question. You say, uh, well, it's going to be the Catholic Church because that's the church that Christ founded. Uh, no, it's not the Catholic Church. You say, well, then you must be an independent fundamental Baptist. Uh, no, certainly not that either. Um, Lutheran? No. Episcopalian? No. Presbyterian? Go down through the list. Which one's the right one? The answer is none of them. There is no such thing as a church that can claim exclusive salvation for every member. Uh, that doesn't happen. Okay, Even the most devout Catholic, the most devout Baptist, whatever else will admit, yeah, there's people in our system that are not following the rules, the traditions, the laws, the catechism, whatever. Um, there are people in every system that are hypocrites. And the problem is with men that they come along and they try to find that right group, that right denomination, the right church to attend and become a part of, an active member of, and whatever else. And they get let down. Because you see, they're looking at men, sinful men. And here's the answer to the question, which Christian group is the right one? Um, none of them, number one. And the second part of that is, you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, with God in heaven. Okay, That's the answer to, to salvation. It's not the Catholic Church that saves you, or the Baptist Church that saves you. It's Jesus Christ, God Himself. You need to know Him. Do you know God? You can if you watch the whole way through this study. I'm going to give you the solution from Scripture, how to have a personal relationship with Him. And of course, people say, well, it doesn't say personal relationship. Yes, but it says that you, may, that you can know Him. If you know somebody, that's a personal relationship. Okay, I'm going to show you the Scriptures today in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to go through the whole chapter, and it will give you the answer of how you can know which group of Christians is the right one. Those people that are born again that have the personal relationship. Let's look at this. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, not the Catholic Church, the church that was founded upon St. Peter's, the St. Peter's and Paul, and it, 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 rejoice in the Lord. How can you rejoice in the Lord if you don't know Him personally? Hmm. To write the same things to you, to me, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. As a Christian, you're going to want to hear the same thing over and over and over again. All right? Um, the renewing of your mind, the Bible talks about in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. You should, should continually want to hear the same things. It's not grievous for a Christian to talk about Jesus Christ every day. It's not some kind of thing to say, well, that kind of got, you know, I tried it for a little while, but it kind of got old. And I tried the Jesus thing a little bit, and it just kind of got old. And I kind of put it on the shelf. Oh, no, no. When you're truly saved, somebody that's truly born again, they just want to talk about Jesus all the time. Very important to remember that. Verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. There are people that will come after you when you truly get saved. And the worst group? will be professing Christians. See, you're going to go to most churches and you're not going to hear that. You're not going to hear it. You're not, you're not going to be told, watch out for the Methodists over there. Watch out for the Catholics. Watch out for the Baptists. Watch out for, the, watch out for people within this own, our own church here. You're not going to be taught that. But you'll discover it soon enough. There's a lot of people that get fervent. They, they, they want to get saved and whatever else and they'll go off to some denomination someplace and they're thinking... They're all starry-eyed, and they go in, and well, it's all filled with good, saved Christians. They say so. They all call themselves Christians, and all of a sudden, you start to hear the stories of this guy just left his wife, and that one's running around. This one's got a drug problem. And that one there just, he's a lying, stealing, thieving, whatever. And you start to realize, eh, beware. You see? You want to be saved? You want to have a personal relationship with the Lord? Then you need to beware of certain people. Verse 3, for we are the circumcision, Paul's speaking here, he's a Jew, uh, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. See, then, so it's not just Jews, but it's also saved Christians there. Spiritually, you're adopted into the nation of Israel. Another study. But look at this, end of verse 3, and have no confidence in the flesh. Hmm. Have no confidence in the flesh. 
Is that true of most Christian denominations out there? No, they exalt the flesh. They tell you that you're a good person. God has special plans for you. Get the whole Joel Osteen and everything else, your best life now. Uh, that's nonsense. Anybody that's saved can look at that thing and say, your best life now? Excuse me? Uh, no, it's in heaven. We lay up treasures in heaven. It's going to be good there. God will wipe away all tears. We're not going to get sick. We're not going to get old, grow old. Best life now? I don't think so. We have no confidence in the flesh. Hmm. You say, well, maybe you, but I'm a good person. I've been to Bible college. I've studied theology. I've even written books on systematic theology. I have a PhD and a THD and a THM and a blah, blah, blah. Let's keep reading. Verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Paul's saying, oh, you want to talk credentials? You want to talk about uh, a good pedigree that he's come from? Check this out. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Oh, there's a, I did some kind of a sin. Okay, well, I'm going to go in and I'm going to do this kind of an offering here. They did that in the Old Testament. You could be blameless under the Old Testament law, you see. Uh, you don't have that today, by the way. I might add that for non-dispensational people. Uh, we, you can't say I'm blameless under the law. They could in the Old Testament. Again, a whole other study there. But you say, what would be a modern day equivalent to Paul? Well, maybe Harvard Divinity School or some kind of a thing like that. Or some, it was kind of, he was like the Ivy League uh, religious, you know, man of his day. Very, very highly educated, very highly trained. You know, he was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the most learned doctors at the time. Um, Paul had all the right things, all the right credentials, a lot more than uh, most of you out there watching certainly more than I've ever had. But what did Paul think about that? All of his, uh, you know, credentials that he had. Verse 7, But what things were gained to me, these, Paul was going the right way, he's, he's really getting in the right circles, get, making the right connections and everything else, they were gained to him as a lost man, those I counted loss for Christ. Uh-oh. Here's the first part of salvation. The things that are gained to you, all the good things that you are and all the good things that you've done and all the nice works and everything else. When you come to the foot of the cross and you look up at Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is saying you're rotten. That's why I had to die here. All your self-righteousness, all your credentials and all your training and everything, it means nothing. You're going to go to hell with that stuff. You want to give it up? He counted it loss. For Christ. You know, you read the story of how Paul got saved. He was called Saul previously, Acts chapter 9. It talks, talks about it. He's on the road to Damascus. He's going to go persecute more Christians. <laughs> and what happens? The Lord knocks him down and he's blind for a couple days. And what does he do? Goes to Damascus and he doesn't eat or drink. He just sits there. And he knows Jesus speaks to him and says, you know, I'm Jesus. You know, why persecutest thou me? You know, I'm paraphrasing there. It's not the exact wording of it, you know. But the, my point I'm trying to make is he's persecuting Christians and Jesus says, actually, you're persecuting me. They're part of my body. Go think about that for a couple days, Paul oh, and uh, Saul. And uh, you're not going to see for a couple days. You know, I bet you he was sitting there thinking to himself, if I get out of this, I'm going to have to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Boy, this is going to cost me. Here I am going on my way to being probably the next Gamaliel, this great doctor of the law. I'm going to have to give all that up. What, what is this going to mean? What am I found? What's my family going to think? I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my family. I'm going to lose my friends, all my connections. And He counted those things lost for Christ, you see. Oh, well, I'm a highly trained Catholic. You ready to give it up? I've been to Bob Jones University. I've got a PhD. I've, I've been to Berkeley. I have, I have a PhD. And I, I'm a, a highly trained Baptist preacher. Are you ready to give it up? What, uh, what are you going to be giving up for Jesus Christ when you get saved? 
Are you ready to have your family turn against you? Your friends turn against you? Hmm. No, I can, I can, I can just kind of go and join a local church and uh, just, you know, play the Christian game thing and I don't really have to give anything up. Then you don't understand true biblical salvation. Verse 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. It isn't just a thing of you giving it up. The Lord's going to take that stuff away. The Lord's going to change who you were back before you got saved. You come to the Lord as a sinner. God says, okay, I purchase you, and now I'm going to change your life. It isn't works salvation. See, works is what you do, all right? And you never really know if you're saved. You're always working your way to get saved. That isn't it. I'm not teaching works salvation. People lie about me and say, oh, he's teaching works. I'm not teaching works salvation. I'm teaching that you come to the Lord and to put an end to your self-righteous pride and you say, I'm no good. God, if you'll save me, you can have my life. And you tell me what to do. And the Lord says, okay, I purchased you. Your life is no longer your own. You're bought with a price. And now I'm going to change things. And you're going to suffer some loss. Did you say suffer? I said suffer. Are you ready for that? Well, I can go to a nice Christian church and they can put me in there in their little social club and everything else and we got the padded pews and we got the nice little kids program and we have spaghetti suppers and we have uh, bake sales and we have all this stuff. You know what they're doing? They're taking away suffering. You can be a respectable member of the community and not have to worry about suffering for Jesus Christ. And you'll go to hell if you do that. But look at this. I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. When you're saved for a while, you look back at your lost life and you say, I can't believe I did all that stuff. Somebody says, you want to go back to that? Are you kidding me? <laughs> go back to that dung that I once was? You walk through a room and there's your military awards. That's dung. There's your college degree, high school diploma, awards for this, awards for that, best of show, wood carving show, best of art show, art this. And I, you look at that and you say, what a wall of dung. What a bunch of junk. What's your life all about now? Jesus Christ. Hmm. Now here we go with the personal relationship. Look at verse 9. And be found in Him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You put your faith in Jesus Christ and His righteousness is imputed to you. Again, how can you be saved and say, oh, I don't need to clean up my life. And whatever. His righteousness is imputed to you. And that doesn't change your life? Of course it changes your life. God's righteousness is given to you. You're going to start living rightly. That is righteousness, you see. You're going to start to have a changed attitude towards sin. I'm not saying you won't fall and do stupid things. Of course you will. Obviously, read Romans chapter 7 if you want proof of that. Paul himself talked about the thing of his struggle with sin. Certainly, you will fall. We'll see it later on as we continue here. But what I'm saying is God's righteousness, when that's imputed to you, it changes your life. But here's one of the best verses on a personal relationship with the Lord. Verse 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. Conformable unto His death. It's not that you have to die on the cross yourself in order to be saved. Okay, If you did, it would be kind of pointless because your blood won't save anything. <laughs> Um, the point is, you read Romans chapter 12, it talks about presenting your body as a living sacrifice. All right, giving up certain things. You're not conformed to the world anymore. That's what true salvation is all about. But notice there, that I may know Him. Uh, what is that? That's a personal relationship. That's not, well, I go to such and such church and I do what I'm supposed to do there and I know the Lord because my pastor told me so. My pastor tells me about who Jesus was, so therefore I know the Lord. I think I'll have to check with my pastor. No. 
You know, I've, I've heard it many, many years growing up in things of, um, you know, somebody gets questions about the Lord and whatever else, and they'll say, I'll have to have you talk to my pastor about that. Oh, uh, don't you know the Lord? They're Christian. Why do you need to have some kind of a, a mediator between you and Jesus Christ? It's kind of weird, isn't it? You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 talks about a, women are to keep silence in the churches. And if they have any question, they're to ask their husband at home. Not, well, i got to call up the pastor because he's got a PhD. He would know the answer to this thing. Every Christian is supposed to know Jesus Christ personally. And they're supposed to know this book. And what happens when you do? The fellowship of His sufferings. The Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed. You will be betrayed when you get truly saved. The Lord Jesus Christ had people that He thought were friends and they turned out to be enemies. So will you. So have I. Um, you'll be disappointed in people. You'll be vexed by the filthy conversation of the world out there. You'll be vexed by the sinfulness of man and how people just don't care anything at all about God. Those are all the things that you're going to have as a Christian. Not some little special insulated bubble called a church building someplace where you go and everybody thinks like you and talks like you and it's a nice thing and we can talk about who's going to win the election next time. Okay? That's not it. Verse 11. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. You say, wait a second. Paul's not sure? No, that's not what he's saying there. He's not saying, I don't know if I'm really going to be resurrected. I don't know if I have eternal security. Um, he knew. What's he talking about? Verse 12, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So what on earth is that talking about? Well, here's the way it works. Jesus Christ said that the way that we, which leadeth unto life is a narrow path. Again, I'm paraphrasing the wording there, but it's, it's a narrow path which leadeth unto you know, life. All right? Jesus is walking, just imagine out here in the woods behind me, there's a narrow path walking through there. And you first get saved and Jesus is way out ahead there, way out ahead. And you start to walk and you start to try to catch up to Him. And as the years go by, you get a little closer to Him. You're trying to apprehend Him, catch up to Him. Notice it says, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. See, He already called you at salvation. He already knows everything about you. He knows what you're capable of. He knows that there are some things that you don't really struggle with, some things that you do. And the Lord is gracious and merciful. And many times what will happen is you get saved. He will wait until years and years and years go by in your process of sanctification until you get victory over certain sins. And you can get frustrated early on because you think, I just can't get rid of the cigarettes. I can't get rid of the, the alcohol or whatever other types of things, the video game addictions or or watching movies or whatever else, and you're struggling with those sins. And you know, every time you do, you fall for it, you feel terrible, and you say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I can't believe I did that again. I can't fell, believe I fell for that thing. And the Lord will bring you through and get you to a point where that will go. You'll get victory over that sin finally, and you'll no longer be tempted. It'll just go onto the dung heap of all the other stuff from your lost life. All right? That's very important to understand that. But here's the point. When you know somebody, when you first meet them, do you know everything about them? No. How long does it take to know, get, really, truly get to know somebody? Well, it takes years. Anybody. Even if you're married, you, you'll know that. It takes many years before you really know your, your spouse. Well, it's the same way with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death, but that thing's not going to happen right away. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, I haven't attained that yet. I'm not already perfect. And people say, well, you can't ever be perfect as a Christian. Well, the Bible says you can. Okay? Um, we'll see that here in a little bit. Um, you can be perfect because you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to you. Right? In that sense. Again, I did a study on that years ago about can a Christian be perfect. But uh, let's continue on here. You should follow the Lord, in other words. You should get to know Him. You see, live righteously with his righteousness, not your own self-righteousness, all right? You're getting to know him. You're getting closer to him all the time. You're catching up to him. In other words, you're trying to apprehend him. 
Verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Paul's saying, I'm not, I haven't gotten there, but I'm walking right beside Jesus Christ yet. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Personal relationship, you see. He's saying, I'm forgetting those things which are behind. He talked about it earlier. He called them dung. He said, forget that lost life. Forget that stuff. You know, and you'll see this thing with false converts all the time. They'll be a Christian for a while and boy, they look like they're doing good. And all of a sudden it's just, well, you know, I, don't, I kind of have some questions and I'm kind of wondering about some things now. And they start to kind of back away and back away. And before long, hey, where's so-and-so? No, they went back to the world. They're an atheist now or something like this. They were never really truly saved. Okay, don't give me this stuff. Well, they just went, they got carnal. No, they didn't get truly saved. You don't go back to the dung heap after you've left it. You see? All right, very important to understand that. Uh, why? Well, if you're following the Lord and trying to apprehend Jesus Christ, you're trying to get closer to Him, you have a personal relationship with Him, how could you ever leave Him? You forget those things which are behind. Verse 15, Let us therefore as many as be perfect... Huh? Wait a second. I thought you said Christians couldn't be perfect. I thought I thought I've seen signs on churches. Nobody perfect here. This is you know uh, right there, right there. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect. Yeah, you can be perfect because you have Christ's righteousness. You see. Again, you can watch my study on that. Get into a lot more detail. Be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Do you know? Part of the thing of personal relationship is God will reveal things to you. You know, I know in my years of marriage, I can, I've many times I sit down and I get to talking to my wife and I tell her some story or whatever, something comes up and we say, hey, you know what, that reminds me of this one time when I was back in high school, I did this thing or that thing or whatever. And she says, you never told that to me before. I never heard that story before. What did I do? I just revealed something new. You see, and that's the way it is with the Lord. There's times that the Lord will reveal some brand new thing to you and you say, I never saw that in that scripture before. I've read through that thing so many times. Wow, that's incredible, Lord. Thank you for showing that to me. You know, you're doing some kind of a thing and whatever else, and all of a sudden the Lord says, uh, hey, you know what? Here's an article. Here's a this or somebody comes into your life and says, hey, you're eating that? Well, you probably shouldn't be eating that. You're drinking that. You shouldn't be drinking that. The Lord will reveal truth to you. Why? To help you in your process of perfection, of apprehending Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is perfect, isn't he? So, well, yeah, of course he is. Well, are you going to get closer to being perfect or farther away from being perfect as you get closer to the Lord? Closer to perfection, you see. And I understand you can't ever be sinlessly perfect. Okay, I've preached against that. And again, people will lie and say, I teach that. I've never taught that. But let's continue. Verse 16, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Notice that one again. Okay, a lot of people will lie about me and say, well, you know, Denlinger thinks that he's the only one that's saved and nobody else is saved. That, that's not true at all. Um, we're all in this, you know, process of sanctification together. And there's sometimes the Lord will convict somebody, a brother or a sister of something, and they'll bring it out and they'll say, hey, what do you think about this and whatever? And it, it makes other Brethren think, and we say, yeah, you know what? Uh, we probably ought to give that up or, you know, whatever. That's what it's saying there. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained. Something's already settled there. Let us walk by the same rule. There's supposed to be fellowship of the Spirit there. I didn't say church buildings with little social club. All right? You get certain things ironed out, certain things figured out. This is Christians shouldn't submit to this. Christians shouldn't do that. And you, you know, the brethren all come together on it. We, you know, you know what? I think that that's true. I think that, that that's that's right. Walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. We're to be all of one mind. You see. Uh, how does that work with denominationalism or church building membership? It doesn't. Okay, you need to ha have people all over the world that are all connected to the same Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And He reveals these things to, to those people. 
spirit of fellowship. Verse 17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. There are certain men out there that God has called into the ministry, and they'll line up with the book, and the Lord will bear witness. They won't be perfect in terms of never making mistakes. <laughs> okay, understand that. But the Lord will show you these are the ones that are standing there. I mean, I, I heard one of the greatest statements, one of the viewers of this ministry um, commented, and they said, that their grandmother told them, never trust a preacher that's afraid to touch a Bible. Amen to that. Absolute truth. You hear some guy, you watch some guy, and he's standing there, and he doesn't have a Bible in his hands, and he's, telling you, he's not telling you, turn in your Bible, get a King James Bible, paper King James Bible, and turn, and you read these verses and make sure I'm telling you the truth. Don't trust him for one second. Some guy's standing up there and he's got the hip trendy look and whatever behind a pulpit. I don't care how good he sounds or whatever else. Don't listen to him. If they're afraid to touch this book and hold this blessed book in their hands, you can't trust them for one second. You look and you see some old time preacher or whatever else and he's got a King James Bible and he's staying, turning your Bible to such and such and whatever. Okay, you can listen to him. You're going to hear some issues and things and whatever else. You have to sort that out. Again, the Lord will show you that stuff. Um, but you need to be careful about that. Verse 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Professing Christians are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Hmm. Whose end is destruction. Here's how you identify them. Obviously, their end is destruction. They're a false convert. But look at this whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Oh boy, what a good way to, to identify these false converts. Their God is their belly. They're interested in uh, more subscribers, so they monetize their channel. We, uh, we're going to use software that can raise my subscription level and raise my viewing level so that I can get more video, I can get that monetization up. Look out for that. Their God is their belly. They're trying to get more food down into their belly there. All right. Whose glory is in their shame. Hmm. Remember I had a neighbor uh, years ago. He's dead and in hell now, but uh, he was a Roman Catholic and a drunkard. And um, he was the kind of guy they, I remember another man in the area told me, he said, that uh, he said, yeah, he said, I remember the one time he said, driving down the road, and he said, there's old Tom laying out in the middle of the road, drunk, drunk as a skunk, you know, just laying there, just passed out, you know. And you talk to Tom about that, yeah, I like to have a little bit of drink now and then, yeah, you know, he, and he laughed about it. What's going on? His glory is in his shame. Do you ever get around these Christians and they say, you know, you see that, that look, good looking girl over there? Don't hurt to look. Look at that. Uh, yeah, it does. The Bible says if you look with lust, it's adultery. You've committed adultery already with, you, with her in your heart. It's adultery. Is your glory in your shame? Well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm no saint you know, here, but uh, I do I like to have a little cigarette once in a while. I like to get a, get a little bit drunk you know, once in a while, but maybe go a little bit too far. Your glory is in your shame. Hmm. Well, I'm a Christian, but I don't think I have to give up Hollywood movies. Oh, you mean Hollywood that hates Jesus Christ, that has an agenda to destroy Jesus Christ? A satanic agenda. Is your glory in your shame? Are you ashamed of those things? Or do you take glory in those things that the Bible condemns? Hmm. Who mind earthly things? Well, I don't think it's possible to live by faith because after all, you know, I mean, the, the times have changed. Okay, women have to work outside the home. All right, that's, we aren't in old times anymore. You can't live by this faith thing. We have to have debt. We have to have insurance policies. We have to have this. We have to, what are you doing? You're mining earthly things. I preached on insurance years ago and people got all upset and angry about it and everything else. But uh, I'm going to tell you right now, you know what insurance is? You're mining earthly things. God can't take care of my health. God can't take care of my finances. God can't take care of my belongings. You mind earthly things. And you can be saved and get it messed up with this stuff. I'm, you know, sure, absolutely understand that. But the Lord's going to get you to a point where He's going to bring you to that point of conviction and say, do you really trust me? 
don't take glory in those things. And again, you get the people that say, well, it's just salvation is just a prayer. It's just a, an intellectual belief. It's just a, it's whatever. There's no repentance. There's no turning from sin. Nothing like that. Why are they doing that? Because they mind earthly things. I don't want to give up this and I don't want to suffer and I don't want to... Yeah. Been dealing for years and years and years with these types of people. Verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, a good mark of somebody that's truly genuinely saved is they're looking for Jesus Christ. They can't wait to see Jesus Christ. I'm going to be doing a study here next called uh, Post Tribbers Are Spiritual Harlots. You see, a harlot, Proverbs chapter 7, the harlot is, she wants to know when her husband is going to be gone, and how long he's going to be gone, and when are you coming back again? I need to know, you're, you, what's the appointed time that you're coming back? You know why? Because she wants to get away with devilment. She wants to go out and play the part of a harlot and go sleep around and commit fornication, just like a lot of Christians do, a lot of professing Christians. I want to know the exact timing of when Jesus Christ is coming back. I need to know these things. Why? Because i got some things I'd rather be doing out there in the world. They don't want to live in an, ex, in an earnest expectation that Jesus Christ could come today and oh, it, it's going to be so great to see Him again. Or not again, but to see Him, you know, saying He's coming again to the earth. But you see what I'm saying. Hmm. Our conversation is in heaven. Don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. I remember I said that years ago and this guy, Greg Miller, professing pastor, he got all you know upset about that. You know, oh, that's not a bad statement. Well, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. That's a worldly statement. Somebody says, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. What does that mean for a Christian? It's the exact opposite for a Christian. Don't be so earthly minded that you're no heavenly good. Our conversation needs to be about spiritual things. You get around most church buildings, you go to the average church building and you, you just, all you got to do, you don't even have to sit through the service. Walk around and listen in on the conversations in that church building. Are you going to vote for Trump next election? Hey, are you going to be going out for deer hunting this weekend? Hey, did you see that new boat that they just came out with? Hey, did you see this new car? Did you hear that? Hey, did you hear about that? The conversation's not in heaven. It's about things of the earth. They mind earthly things. You're in the wrong Christian group. Finish up here, verse 21. Lord Jesus Christ, verse 20. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. You go through the process of sanctification, the Lord's saying, hey, follow me. See if you can apprehend me. See if you can catch up to me. But he knows you can only go to a certain point as a, as a mortal man. So what's then the solution? The Lord is going to say, come up hither. He's going to catch up his body, the bride of Jesus Christ. Again, a, a lot of studies I could go through to prove all this stuff. But the, the point is, he catches up the body of Christ and says, okay, now you're no longer corruptible. You're incorruptible in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's what we look forward to when Jesus Christ shall change this vile body. Do you look at yourself in the mirror and think that you're vile? You say, well, I'm not so bad a person. Then you're not saved. If you don't think that you're a bad person, if you don't struggle with sin on a daily basis, you're not saved. You're not a Christian. Well, everybody, nobody else at church talks to me this way. Then you're in the wrong Christian group. I'm not so bad. I'm, I'm a good person. I have got lots of good friends. We, get, you know, we have Bible study together and we have some really good sweet times of fellowship. Then go to hell and burn. That's where you're headed. You don't know the Lord. I mean, you really think that you could stand in the presence of Jesus Christ? If He shows up here physically and He stands here beside me, you think I'm going to say, oh, hey, hey, how you doing? I'm going to be hitting the dirt. I'm going to be getting down on my hands and my knees and saying, oh God, have mercy on me. He can read my thoughts. He knows everything about me. I'm going to feel like a vile, wretched, wicked sinner as a saved Christian 
in front of the Lord of glory, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I look to him and I say, how soon, Lord, can you make this thing happen? How soon can we get rid of this old, vile, wicked body? I thank you for the fellowship of the sufferings. I've had plenty of people stab me in the back over the years. I've seen the wickedness of the world. It vexes my soul. I can understand some of what you went through on a very small scale. But I'm sure looking forward to having a new body to go into being with you. I'm saved. I'm born again. And uh, I can speak with authority on these things because, you see, I was a false convert for many, many years. I know what it's like to play the religion game. To go from church to church and say, well, I don't like the music at this one, but I sure do like the music over there. And, and, and this one here is just kind of small and kind of cramped, and it smells sort of musty. But this one here, oh boy, they just built on a multi-million dollar expansion. And look at the mirrored walls and the nice chandeliers and everything. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, I understand it. I understand all about churches and denominations and which group is the right one and everything else. It's all false. You need to know the Lord personally. There's no denomination out there that you can go and join and you're guaranteed a place in heaven. Nope. Nope. You need to know Him. And for you to know Jesus Christ, you're going to suffer the loss of all things. He's just going to slowly take this away and He's going to take that away. And you get closer to Him, you're going to realize hey, there's less people walking with me. Hmm. A lot of people that start out and you're hiking and there's a whole lot of people like a big marathon. They're all walking with Jesus and Jesus is up ahead and all of a sudden the Lord takes a turn. He turns against movies. Follow me, He says. And a whole lot of people stop and they say, I don't think there's anything wrong with this movie. I, I don't think I can go down there. I don't think I can go on that road. I'm just going to stay right here. See ya. And you walk with the Lord and you go down a little bit farther and the Lord says, uh, how about that junk food? Natural eating, the food that I created. No brainer, you know. I'm going to go down this way. Follow me. Okay, I'll keep following. Get down a little bit farther. The Lord says, uh, church attendance. You people want to keep going to the church, you go to the left. Those that want to have personal fellowship and Bible study with me, you go to the right. Do you want to say that you're a Bible believer in all matters of faith and practice? Nobody went to church in the Bible. Follow me. Let's go to the right. Or you can go to church and go to the left. Well, there's so many people going to the left, Lord. I should really go with them. The Lord says, I'm going to the right. You really want to know me? Well, if, Lord, if I go with you, those people are going to laugh at me. Uh huh. Yeah, they're laughing at me too right now. I'm going to the right. And on and on and on. Hmm. A lot of people don't count the cost of what it means to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. They come to the Lord and they still kind of have that self-righteousness in their back pocket. Just in case. You know, just in case it doesn't work out. I mean, the Jesus thing really looks good right now. I think it's really going to be good for me. I think it's what my family needs. I think it'll help my marriage. I think it'll help my finances. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think it's going to work out real nice. And they are following Jesus for a little bit of time and all of a sudden it's, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. This is kind of, ugh, I don't think I want this. And I'm not saying they ever got saved. I'm saying they do the little religion thing for a while. And uh, they turn back. They go right back to the world. End up in hell for all of eternity. You say, what do I need to do to get saved? Um, right there is the key to it. Not me. The Bible. You need to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to come to the end of yourself. You're not a good person. So why? I, you're not a good person. Just as simple as that. And until you come to the end of your self-righteousness, you're never going to get saved. And when you give yourself over to the Lord and the Lord saves you, He saves you. You don't save yourself. He's going to start telling you what to do with your life. So, that's going to be it for this study. Um, don't fall for Christian denominations or churches or whatever else. That stuff's all false. Not even in there. All right? I mean, think about it. 
Are you a Lutheran? You're following a man named Martin Luther. Um, are you a Wesleyan Methodist? Oh, you mean John Wesley? Down through? Oh, you're in the line of the succession of the popes? Oh, you're following men. You're not following Jesus Christ. I do hope that you make the right decision because it's your eternity that's at stake here. It's not a game. It's not a thing of, well, we'll all end up in the same place. Uh, if you're lost, yeah, that's true. Um, if you're saved, no. We're not all going to end up in the same place. So um, pray about these things. Ask the Lord to show you the truth. Read your King James Bible. All right? That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.